The assistant goes to the master bedroom, child. Oh, my God. Goes to the master bedroom, comes in, and this goddamn drag queen turns around and full Diana Ross clothing, child, wig, eyelashes, and everything, and says, You must knock before you enter the boss's room. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky lookies are our ooh, holiday turbans in blue velvet. Ooh. And our, what are these, Syrah shades? All turbans come with a free gift. All shades, excluding the punk funk shades, come with an eyeglass case. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Call Her Miss Ross, the unauthorized biography of Diana Ross by our dude, JRT. I cut off contact with friends. I really felt that nobody cared about me anyway. I found that the friends I had made in show business were really fair weather, and I went into a deep state of depression. I thought about taking my life lots of times, but I didn't do that. I know now it was because God had his hands on me. I felt that because of my son, I had to go on. Most of the time, I just stayed in the apartment in a desperate state. The world had loved me, and then it was all gone. Cindy Birdsong became a born-again Christian in the 80s, which she says saved her and gave her new determination to live life to be to the fullest. Unlike Florence Ballard, she found a way to help herself and to feel happy and fulfilled. She obtained a job at the UCLA Medical Center as a lab aide and lived under her married name, her past occupation unknown to co-workers and neighbors. Diana Ross had no idea that Cindy Birdsong had had such a difficult time, but finding out, she began to lend a helping hand. In the mid-80s, Motown attempted to negotiate with Diana for the rights to her life story. The past was trying to mount a Supreme's biography called Where Did Our Love Go? Most observers felt that the past was being naive if she thought that Ross would ever consider selling her life story to Motown, especially now that she was signed to RCA. Diana probably had no intention of doing so, but she procrastinated long enough for Cindy Birdsong to get $30,000 for her part of the Supreme story. Then apparently Diana pulled out of the deal. The program still has not been produced. Birdsong didn't have to return the advance. You go, Diana. I would have did the same thing. I would have been gooping the children. They gooped her. After leaving UCLA, Cindy began working for Suzanne DePaz and Motown Productions. For the most part, DePaz and her staff treated her with indifference and often even disrespectful. Sadly, many of the upper level management employees were so insecure in their jobs that they took great pleasure in making Birdsong, a former star, feel small and insignificant in the big corporate structure. 
Ironically, she was once part of the group that helped put Motown on the map and allowed Gordy to hire so many young, ambitious people, many of whom went on to become executives. Finally, Birdsong quit Motown Productions to resume her singing career. Let me, Let me tell, tell you about this bitch, Suzanne, big back to pass. I used to like you. I don't like you no more. Silverback, I don't like you. That's not my words. That's Barry Gordy's words. Barry Gordy called her a gorilla. Act like a gorilla, Suzanne, and this dumb bitch ooh, ooh, ooing all over the place in front of all the goddamn old Motown people. She acting like a monkey in front of everybody or a gorilla in front of everybody just so that she could be Barry's right-hand man. When she embarked on a comeback tour in London as a solo artist, she found herself stranded there with no money. Often, Cindy has borrowed money from Diana Ross and has always found a way to repay Diana's generosity. When she embarked on a comeback tour in London as a solo artist, she found herself stranded there with no money. Often Cindy has borrowed money from Diana Ross and has always found a way to repay Diana's generosity to her. From Europe, Cindy tried to get in touch with Diana to ask for assistance, but Diana's telephone number had been changed and no one who had it wanted to give it to her. Hating ass bitches. Hating, hateful, hateful. Guess who was one of the hating ass bitches that didn't want to give her the number? Suzanne Big Back the Patsy. Okay, that hating ass bitch. Rather than give her Diane's telephone number, Suzanne DePass simply ignored Bird Song's calls. You dirty bitch, you. You dirty bitch. I hope you aged terribly. Unfortunately, she's not. Unfortunately, she's not aging bad. Dirty bitch. Just at this time, ironically, Us Magazine published a feature about Suzanne DePass in which she discussed how she was now in a power position at Motown because Cindy had introduced her to Barry Gordy in 1968. Did y'all forget about that? I didn't. Diana Ross brought Cindy in. Cindy introduced Barry Gordy to this, you know, vicious Power player, Suzanne DePassi. I mean, she's a bigger power player now. But. You know what's messed up? Considering that uh, Cindy Birdsong is responsible for putting you in that power position or, you know, connecting you with the, the, the opportunity to be put in a power position, she shouldn't even had to go to Diana Ross. She shouldn't even had to go through you to get to Diana Ross. She should have just been able to say to you what the situation was, and Suzanne DePass should have been like, I got you, baby. Don't even worry about it. People in the business, when I say fair weather, man, God going to get you, bitch. Just at this time, ironically, Us Magazine published a feature about Suzanne DePass in which she discussed how she was now in a power position at Motown because Cindy had introduced her to Barry Gordy in 1968. She was my friend then and she's my friend now, DePass said. Let me put it this way. Cindy Birdsong can have anything I've got. Yeah, anything but Diana Ross's phone number, Cindy Birdsong said to a friend. Birdsong managed to return to the United States without the help of her former singing partner. But she knows that she can call upon Diana Ross whenever she needs her. Mary and Cindy were not the only people from the past Diana had seen. Janie Bradsford, the woman who thought up the name The Supremes in 1961, had asked Diana for some sort of financial assistance. Let me tell you how vicious Diana is. I know you're like, nay, get off the Diana Ross train. No. So instead of giving Janie Bradsford a fish, she taught Janie Bradsford how to fish. Okay? What she did was um, the song, um, what song was it? It was a muscles, okay? I want muscles. Mm, mm, mm. Ooh. That song. Back in right? the day when we had singles, you know, because you could buy just one song like you can now, but it wasn't streaming, you know, type thing. It was you literally had to buy like this disc thing made out of vinyl, right? They had an A side and a B side. What Diana Ross said to Janie Bradsford and this other dude, what's his name? Hold on. Freddie Gorman, okay? What she said was, look, y'all write me a song, okay? And we already know that Muscle's going to be a hit. I'm 
going to sing a song that you give to me for the B-side. What happened right. was because they put the Janie Bradsford song on the B-side, she had came up with a lick. You hear me? Because the, the writers, producers, arrangers, whatever that is, that are on the flip side of the album get just, or the single, get just as much money as the writers, producers, arrangers do on the A side. So can you imagine the amount of money that Janie Bradsford gets just for being on the flip side of muscles? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Certainly this has never been the case with Diana Ross. Despite what she says happened at Motown towards the end of her career there, that she only had a couple of hundred thousand dollars to her name, she obviously has not had a moment of genuine concern about finances in 30 years. As for others who have not been so fortunate, she explained to a friend, I just have to weed them out. I can't help everybody. I don't want to. Why should I? I think we're all responsible for ourselves. You better say it. You got some people that are so spoiled that they think they're entitled to something. So anyway, Donna Ross got this house over there on 701 Maple Avenue. She's trying to get rid of it, right? She bought the house for $300,000. But what she thought was because the house once belonged to Diana Ross or belongs to Diana Ross. It's just Diana Ross ain't going around there no more. You know, she got the other stuff going on over there. She decided that I'm going to sell it for $2 million, right? It was overpriced. All the real estate people told her, girl, you can't sell that house for $2 million and you only paid like $300,000. I mean, maybe you can do maybe a million, but not $2 million, right? I don't care. It's my house and it's beautiful, right? Because she had did some additions and all of that to the place, but it still did not equate a $2 million sale, right? Shit, they selling houses now for $2 million. What is that? What is that? The, uh, the uh, R. Kelly ghost house is worth, what is that worth? How much, can I buy the R. Kelly house? I know that must worth like 13 cent right now. Is that on the market? Girl, I will come through there with sage and priest and exercise that mother. You hear me? And I will buy that shit for 13 cents. You hear me? I know ain't nobody going to buy the R. Kelly house. I know that. But I, I buy that shit for 13 cents. Donna Ross is like, you know what? Forget about it, right? She still used the house to hold some of her items, right? You know, it's still the Diana Ross house, right? So one day she had sent one of her assistants around there to get one of the gowns out of the closet. Child, let me tell you what these damn drag queens did, child. Oh, my God. The assistant goes to the master bedroom, child. Oh, my God. Goes to the master bedroom, comes in, and this goddamn drag queen turns around and full Diana Ross clothing, child, wig, eyelashes, and everything, and says, you must knock before you enter the boss's room. Child, I was dead. The assistant did like, what? What the is going on here? The, the drag queen is so caught up in the moment, she not even understanding. Bitch, I'm about to call the police on you. This is not your house. But I get it. Let me tell you something. I can't tell y'all that I would never break into the Diana Ross house, okay? And just, you know, put on her gowns and pretend to be that lady. I can't tell you that I wouldn't do that, all right? Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine putting your body into a Bob Mackie worn by the Diana? Oh my God. Well, first of all, I couldn't put my body in it because it's too, uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't do that. But anyway, could you imagine? But things like that used to happen frequently at that house. Okay. Let me tell you how my Diana Curry did. She's like, wait a minute. We got people breaking into my house, wearing my gowns, living in my house, sleeping in my bed like it's theirs, you know, and it was because she rarely went to the home. Right. So what she did right? Remember, she's still working with uh, Loeb and Loeb, the lawyers. They had a paralegal there. She allowed the paralegal to live in the home for free, okay? So now you got somebody that was just a paralegal living in that house, rent free. She don't have to pay nothing. She's just living there. Now, because there's someone living now, the, living there now, the insurance premiums go down. So that was also, you know, an asset for Diana Ross. After many more incidents, Diana decided in March 1983 to have John Mackey, a paralegal from Loeb and Loeb, live at the house. From June 17th 
to 19th, Diana taped a music video for Pieces of Ice, her latest single in Manhattan with director Bob Geraldi. Geraldi, there you go, best known for his work with Michael Jackson. Geraldi had directed the taping of the Pepsi commercial during which Michael's hair caught fire because of special effects. The video cost Anade Film Productions $122,500. Even though, said Diana of the concept, it means nothing, but it's interesting. Child, to, remember, remember the budgets? For uh, videos back then, like Thriller, oh my God, I don't know how much that shit costs. I don't know. And then now these people are doing uh, videos on, on iPhones now. Oh my gosh. Times have changed. Like, uh, what's his name? Chief Keith. Remember he was on um, House Arrest and he just had all his friends come over the house and they singing that song. I forget the name of the song. Uh, that shit I don't like. That song. It don't take nothing to make videos now. They were spending mad paper on them videos back then, girl. Jesus. And I'm like, why did we waste so much money on that shit? Not we, because I don't have no damn video out there, Chad. The song proved a commercial failure because no one, not even Diana, as she would admit later, understood the lyrics with their artsy and confusing imagery. Long etropic nights, zebra lightning and tunisia pieces of ice was called from her third rca album ross produced in part by steely dan producer gary katz the album sales proved to be disappointing even though it was not really a bad record just a dull one diana ross of the 80s will probably best be remembered for her two central park concerts in july 1983 in a way, that's a pity because even though the first concert proved memorable, both performances showed more of her weakness than her strengths. Old school, put your hands up. Put the best on Already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, visit Uptop Beauty so that you can get one of these ooh holiday turbans, blue velour, baby. I like this. And remember this: the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves you, babies. Y'all better have a good one. Peace.